Hello class, and welcome to the third lecture for Mechanics of Solids. Today, we're going to be discussing Chapter 3, which covers the mechanical properties of materials. There are eight sections in this chapter, covering tension and compression test, the stress-strain diagram, the behavior of ductile and brittle materials, Hooke's law, strain energy, Poisson's ratio, the shear stress-strain diagram, and failure to decrease and fatigue. The tension and compression test is the primary test used to determine the ratio between stress and strain for a material. Specimens are loaded to produce a constant, usually slow, increasing strain while taking frequent measurements of the applied load. During a tension or compression test, we develop the stress-strain diagram. In these diagrams, we usually account for the engineering stress and engineering strain. Engineering stress is equal to the applied load divided by the initial cross-sectional area and doesn't account for any decrease in cross-sectional area due to the applied load. Engineering strain is equal to the elongation divided by the gauge length, which is the original length between two marked points. This assumes an even distribution of strain throughout the test sample. This diagram illustrates the different regions of the stress-strain diagram for a ductile material, such as steel. The first region is called the elastic region, and is the range where the stress and strain are linearly related. The point at which the relationship between stress and strain is no longer linear is called the proportional limit. This is followed by the elastic limit, which is the point at which the material will begin to plastically deform, and the yield stress, which is the stress at which the material will yield at a constant rate at a given stress. After the material starts to harden relative to yielding, we see a region called strain hardening, where the strength of material increases until it finally reaches the ultimate stress or the highest engineering stress available to the material. After this point, we have a phenomenon called necking, where a portion of the material will experience a decrease in cross-sectional area, increasing the stress in the member, but decreasing the amount of load it can support, until it ultimately reaches the failure stress where the member will break. This diagram is not to scale, and not all materials will experience all the regions described in this diagram. Based on their properties at failure, materials are often described as being brittle or ductile. A material that can undergo a large strain before failure, and specifically a yielding strain or a plastic strain, are called ductile. Materials that exhibit little or no yielding before failure are referred to as brittle. The ductility of a material is often described by the percent elongation, or the strain at failure times 100%, or the percent reduction of area, which is equal to the original cross-sectional area minus the area at failure divided by the original cross-sectional area times 100%. This is an example of a stretch strain curve for mild steel. As you can see from this curve, the elastic strain is much less than the yielding strain, strain hardening strain. So it has been expanded for ease of reading using the light blue line. We can see all the regions of the stretch strain curve on this diagram. First, the elastic region is shown in light blue from zero strain to a strain of 0.12% where we reach the proportional limit. And then we have the yielding stress, both an upper yielding stress and a lower yielding stress. The upper yielding stress describes the end of the elastic region and the beginning of yielding, whereas the lower yielding stress describes the constant stress that the material will yield at until it starts to strain harden. The ultimate stress is 63 KSI, which is kilopounds per square inch, which is, the re which is the region where the material starts to neck until it reaches the failure stress of 47 KSI. Not all materials have a clearly defined yield stress. This is especially true for brittle material. This figure shows the stress strain curve for aluminum alloy. Here, the 0.2% offset method has been used to determine a theoretical yielding stress for use in engineering design. Some materials don't exhibit the typical regions that we associate with other engineering materials. For instance, this diagram of natural rubber has no region of a linear relationship between stress and strain, and its stiffness increases dramatically as it approaches its failure stress. Additionally, many materials have different properties in tension as opposed to compression. For instance, for this diagram of a typical concrete mix, the strength of material and tension is very low, while the strength of compression is very high. Material properties are also a function of temperature. For instance, in this diagram for a typical plastic, 
we can see that at higher temperatures, the material is much stiffer than it is at lower temperatures. By performing tension and compression tests, and using the information from the stress strain diagram, we can see that the materials exhibit a relationary relationship between stress and strain. This is called Hooke's Law, where the stress is equal to the Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity, times the strain. This is equal to the slope of the stress strain curve in the elastic region, and is only valid for the elastic region of the material. If a ductile material is loaded into the plastic region, it will undergo a permanent deformation. However, when it is unloaded, it will recover the elastic strain based on the Young's modulus of the material. Materials that are purposefully stretched to increase their elastic region are said to be strain hardened. As the material is deformed by an external load, it stores energy internally. The internal energy, or the strain energy, must be equal to the external work done on the system. To specify strain energy as a unit of volume, we take the total strain energy and divide by a unit of volume. The equations given here assume a linear relationship between applied load and deformation, and therefore are only valid for the elastic region of materials. Two material properties that describe the ability of a material to absorb energy are the modulus of resilience and the modulus of toughness. The modulus of resilience describes the amount of energy that can be absorbed by a material before it plastically deforms, the modulus of toughness defines the total amount of energy a material can absorb before it fails. In the early 1800s, Simon Poisson realized that the contraction of a bar in tension was proportional to its elongation. We find that this is true for the elastic region of homogeneous isotropic materials. We use this principle to define the Poisson's ratio, which is equal to the negative ratio of the lateral strain over the longitudinal strain. We can use this to find the lateral strain of a member subject to a load along its longitudinal axis. The relationship between shear stress and strain and normal stress and strain is very similar, except for we use the modulus of rigidity, or the shear modulus of elasticity, G, to describe the relationship between the shear stress and the shear strain. For homogeneous isotropic materials, the modulus of rigidity, the modulus of elasticity, or the Young's modulus, and the Poisson's ratio are not independent. For many materials, the modulus of elasticity and the Poisson's ratio are determined through experimentation, and the shear modulus of elasticity, or the modulus of rigidity, is the term used in the equation below. Materials subject to a constant stress or strain will yield slowly over time. This is called creep. The creep strength is the strength of a material after a long period of time after it has been subjected to a constant strain. Materials that are subject to a cyclical loading will fail at a much lower stress than under a constant load. This is called fatigue. The endurance limit describes the point at which the number of cycles has no effect on the strength of material. Thank you for watching this review of the mechanical properties of materials. Next time, we'll investigate the deformation of materials subject to axial loads.